Cody, you start it. Working, Angus. Okay, I'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you very much uh, for the uh, the intro there, um, Angus, and um, thanks very much for for signing up or turning up this evening. Um, hopefully, it'll be a, a, an interesting overview of about forty five minutes with some time for questions at the end. Um, of course, in the good old days, we'd have loved to have turned up in person um, and uh, you know been there with some refreshments and maybe a you know a bottle of beer. I think I may have seen in the background there, very envious. Um, sadly, uh, the best we can offer tonight is a uh, is a sandwich of speakers. I think with. Um, um, me as the top slice um, covering um, a bit of an introduction um, and track uh, monitoring applications. Uh, Callum is going to be the uh, the bottom slice um, serving up a, a, an overview of, uh, of structures applications and Chris will be the uh, the tasty filling in the middle um, looking at earthworks um, applications of, of wireless monitoring. So um, hopefully there's a bit in there for everything, everybody. We've, um, I think it's difficult to know how to pitch these things in terms of um, of um, detail. Um, as you'll have heard from the intro, none of us are full-time rail people, unlike yourselves. Um, we come more from the sort of data collection, monitoring side of things, but. Um, I think uh, hopefully there is enough kind of rail knowledge in the group to uh, to meet your needs, um, and hopefully we the, the you know we're, we're not going to go into the, the the sort of deep detail in terms of monitoring technology. We, we're aiming to give a bit of an overview of um, a range of applications, and and we'd love to talk more if people are interested in in finding out more later. So. Um, I'm pretty sure that um, nobody signed up today for an advertisement session about uh, Sensiv, um, so we're not going to do that, but I do think it's useful to uh, to provide a little bit of context. Um, Sensiv was a IoT, Internet of Things, spin out from University College London in 2005. Um, basically a couple of smart guys with an innovative radio mesh technology, but no real place to put it, no real product to place in the market, no customer. Um, and by a combination of fate and good luck, Network Rail turned out to be the people who suggested an application for connecting sensors in railway monitoring and were the first customer back in those days in, in early 2005. And Network Rail and the UK um, um, rail sector has been the biggest customer for this technology ever since then. Um, so while Sensive build technology that is used across engineering, it's always been focused on rail and our product development team have been steered by the needs, the, sp the special needs of the rail sector and the products have been built for rail applications. They're approved for use on Network Rail, London Underground and, and a lot of other international operators. And from that small kernel of two or three people um, stepping out of academia, we're now more than 80 people uh, based out of Milton Keynes, conveniently close to uh, the Mothership Network Rail head office. And, um, We've got people using our kit in 40 countries now um, and they include railways throughout Europe, uh, the Americas, Australia, uh, New Zealand uh, and, and, and more. So that's us and the sort of technology that, 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 that we're about. We, and we've really just sort of developed the, the communication platforms and the sensors from that stage. And we've done that to a point where um, we can put a lot of different uh, instruments around a railway environment um, to gather sort of information that hopefully people like you guys would ask us for. But I think it's important to consider some of the key parameters that are needed for a railway condition monitoring technology to be effective, to, 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 to face up to the challenges of, um, of railway um, environments for a technique to be viable, to be useful here, it needs to be sufficiently robust to put up with weather, 
with vibration of passing trains of maintenance operations it needs to um, have a reasonable chance against um, theft and vandalism risk it needs to be sufficiently precise to compare favorably with other methods with optical methods with um, visible inspection with, with with the alternative methods it needs to be sufficiently repeatable to be stable and predictable to be um, enable us to uh, distinguish between false alerts and real events um, and it needs to be sufficiently flexible to fit into an ecosystem of other data collection sensors and instruments and for the data that's collected to be accessible and viewable alongside a whole load of other data streams so you know it, we don't want this to be a silo of, of information it has to fit into all the rest of the data that you collect and the other information both historic and, and current that you gather so I think if we manage to tick those boxes and uh, we kind of like to feel that we can tick most of them in, in most applications but we do tend to get a bit carried away and if we do that this evening now uh, please um, bear in mind we're not genuinely trying to pretend this is the perfect technology this is not a silver bullet there are constraints there are limitations you just take the example um, for example that the bulk of our applications rely on a cellular mobile phone connection to connect between the site and the stakeholder so if you've got a lousy phone signal then you're going to be scrabbling around for another way of getting the data from the site to the user so there are constraints there are limitations of course there are um, uh, so if Chris and Callum and myself we we get a bit too enthusiastic about this because we are very keen on this technology um, yeah we we're not trying to say it's it's the silver bullet it is not going to answer everything you want but hopefully you know the course of this next sort of session um, it'll give you a feel for where it might be able to help most of our focus tonight will be around um, I guess measuring movement in various situations um, and the use of tilt sensors in particular to achieve that. Um, but before we get into that, I, would, I just wanted to paint a picture that there is a whole bunch of other um, sensor types that can be incorporated into a wireless remote condition monitoring solution. Um, for example, at the top, you know, Chris is going to talk about a solution that incorporates a cellular camera so that you can not just take measurements and get data, numeric data from a site, but you can also see what's happening before you can get boots on the ground. Um, Callum's going to talk about some structural applications where we use an optical displacement sensor, which is effectively a tilt sensor that also has a laser distance meter built into it. Um, it can measure the relative distance between two um, two surfaces, two physical objects. I think Callum's also going to talk about um, crack sensors that uh, that can uh, be used to uh, um, integrate with other sensors built by other people. You know, not not all of this kit is built by Sensive. You know, the 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 the, uh, the nodes, the wireless nodes that connect um, these sensors does come from from our. Um, uh, uh, our, our, our background but quite often we'll connect into third-party sensors like a crack sensor for a structural application or um, sneakily hidden in the uh, the corner over here um, we've also got applications in boreholes where we've got um, geotechnical instruments we can link um, piezometers or in inclinometers or extensometers into the sort of whole wireless um, ecosystem um, and enable you to get geotechnical data without having to send people out to do manual logging. So quite a lot of advantages there. Um, so there's a whole range of different sensors. Basically, um, the concept is that um, they are fixed to the structure that you're interested in whether it's the track or whether it's another part of the rail corridor in this case we've got a series of tilt sensors mounted on stakes and um, they're looking at uh, the stability of a slope now the common point here is that the way these tilt sensors work the way that they collate data and communicate it to you as in the user is that uh, 
they send data from uh, to to their neighbours. Um, they form a mesh, a radio mesh of um, uh, of connected sensors, which relays data back to the gateway in the bottom right corner there, which is a cellular modem effectively transmitting data back to the internet and 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 to uh, a platform that you can you can access. So the sort of schematic illustration here is of a of a platform which did have its roots right back in 2005. Um, it's it's called Flatmesh um, and it's a highly responsive robust way of connecting sensors in the field. Um, it can put up with damage in an individual node is taken out by a bulldozer or um, something goes wrong with it, then the mesh can automatically recover and find its um, still its most efficient way of, 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 of self healing and sending data back to the uh, back to the user. And the user will see that data um, on a platform in the first instance, um, an online Sensive platform in this case uh, called Web Monitor, which is basically a, a portal that allows people to um, look at the sensors they've got out in the field, to uh, read the data, to receive alerts of events that happen outside of the preset threshold. And um, depending on the needs of individual people, um, to th the data can be uh, ported from here into other third party visualization tools. Uh, so this allows you to view the data and it allows you to interact to a degree with the sensors. You can change the frequency of sampling, for example. You can request a photograph from your camera if you've got that deployed. So in terms of um, real life sort of applications, then um, that's a bit of an introduction done. And um, I'm now just going to focus on um, three or four um, metrics that can be delivered um, from track in particular. And um, yeah, the four that we've picked out really here, um, a cant and twist, which are probably the most established applications, the most common applications for uh, this technology in track geometry um, measurements. Um, and I'd also just sort of look at uh, look changes in longitudinal profile um, and lateral movement in the form of SLU. The way that um, this is achieved in at least three of those four cases anyway, um, uses the uh, the tilt sensor that you can see here. So the tilt sensor for scale, it's I don't know, typically sort of tennis ball sized device um, in a, a waterproof um, enclosure. In this case, it's a, um, a, a modern sensor called a nano, which incorporates the antenna into a single shell case and um, you can see here that that is simply um, attached to a sleeper in the case of in this in this particular case it's uh, just fixed down with um, rapid fix um, adhesive typically to timber sleepers we would use a screwed attachment a track mounting plate would be screwed into the sleeper um, it would typically be glued to a concrete sleeper and potentially mag mounted onto a steel sleeper. So any type of sleeper can be uh, applicable here and it's it's incredibly quick and simple. It doesn't need um, a skilled um, surveyor engineer to, to, uh, to put these sensors out in the field. Um, it's not unusual for one person to put 100 sensors in place um, in, a, in, in, a, in a session and um, it doesn't require any any particular um, skill set. Um, so as long as it's um, you know set up and configured properly in the, in the first place. So these are battery powered um, units. They contain a D cell battery, and at a thirty minute reporting interval, they'll uh, be a, be put out in the field tomorrow. They will be still working in ten to fifteen years time with that battery. So that a lot of engineering has gone into making this incredibly lean in terms of its power consumption um, and incredibly efficient in the way that it transmits the data through that mesh um, network. So the first of the metrics that I was going to look at really here um, is uh, the use of these tilt sensors to uh, determine change in cant or, or cross level. And uh, I'm going to do that with a series of somewhat simplified and exaggerated animations um, and a graph, a data graph for, for, for each. So the 
the change in Kant is measured directly uh, from the rotational movement of, of these individual sensors. It's, it's a well-established, proven, verified approach, which has been pretty common since 2014, 2015. The resolution has been found to be, um, I think, probably considerably better than 0 0.1 of a degree, uh, of a millimetre, sorry, for a standard um, gauge uh, mainline track um, subjected to you know the rigors of, of mainline traffic and um, if we take a look at this um, this little clip of video which is hopefully running for you now um, you can see the uh, somewhat exaggerated cant uh, change here the sensors are buzzing away and the data is demonstrated on a, on a plot here um, what we're looking at here is data from five tilt nodes over a five day period um, and the X axis is plotting um, vertical displacement um, from positive one millimeters down to minus one millimeter. And, and what it's telling us here is that three of the nodes along that sort of central axis, they're, they're bumbling up and down a little bit, but that really is just within the sort of noise uh, threshold. Um, they are effectively stable and not not moving significantly, but two of them um, plotted in red and blue are showing a significant level of movement. Uh, they've moved vertically uh, in a positive vertically up um, by um, 0.5 of a millimeter in this case. So that's the, uh, the measurement of Kant. So to determine twist, we take those current measurements and we uh, um, we can process those um, to determine both relative and absolute twist measurements. And, and these can be uh, can be measured um, and compared with the, the measured and the design characteristics of the track. And um, if we then take a look at this animation moving through and the graph, we'll see um, Hopefully the twist motion um, being apparent in here. Uh, Chris was telling me earlier that he didn't think it was a particularly great uh, um, angle to view it from, so we may have to tweak that little animation. Um, but um, there's the plot um, showing, uh, again, relatively stable reading from three of the nodes, but um, a level of movement, uh, in this case of, of um, vertical displacement of negative um, 0.5 millimetres. So and this is useful in places where there might be unstable track bed or, or culverts or, or tight radius curves or where there's third party works uh, going on. Um, and we look at an example here. Um, this is a bit of an oldie but goodie. Uh, this is a East London um, and we can see um, hopefully it's visible. However, you're viewing this. There's a little misalignment in the outside rail. Um, there was concern about um, construction activity that was going on and behind the hoarding to the side of that track there um, and uh, a relatively early deployment of this sort of approach was 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 uh, um, commissioned and again we can see here that um, there is a pattern of um, relatively stable um, movement for a number of the sensors but um, um, three of them are the ones that are actually closest to um, an excavation uh, associated with that construction work are actually uh, moving fairly significantly. In this case, um, up to nine millimeters vertically um, in terms of cant change. At the same site, um, we can see readings from a, a, a set of uh, the same set of track nodes, and we can see the twisting effect where. Um, some of the nodes have moved vertically up and some of them have moved vertically down so that we've got that sort of range of movement um, through the middle, only about one or two millimetres, but the top one has gone up approximately five millimetres. It's a little bit faint in the yellow there, I apologise for that. The green one at the bottom has dropped down by about six millimetres. And if we look the other side of those hoardings, we can see the cause of that movement um, is associated with um, an excavation which has caused ballast to slump away from the track and reduce the, uh, the support to that outside rail. So 
I think with um, the more extreme weather and especially our hot summers, there's more concern about tracks buckling and slewing and braking and tilt sensors. Whilst they're not able to, uh, well, whilst we're not able to use a tilt sensor for this because it doesn't measure lateral movement um, that is in a horizontal plane, um, there are alternative approaches here. Um, and we we're able to measure that sort of change in lateral position using an optical displacement sensor. So you can see in the photograph here, this is basically using the laser extensometer built into this sensor. It's mounted on something physical, physically stable. Um, it could be a platform edge, a gantry, or in this case, some concrete structure. And we measure the, uh, the change in the position of the rail relative to that sensor. So as we've got um, a, a slewing action um, along a short section of this particular track here. Um, we can look at the data and this is a plot showing it's it's a schematic plot, but it is based on actual data that came through that hot period in August last summer where the red line plots changes in temperature and the blue line plots changes in the uh, the lateral position of the track. So we've got positions here uh, down to minus minus one millimeters movement of um, uh, uh, between plus and, and one and minus one millimeter. Um, finally, in terms of these sort of track geometry metrics, longitudinal settlement, um, this is a calculated rather than a directly derived um, um, metric. This is um, we, we we determine the long profile based on multiplying um, the y-axis readings of a series of um, tilt sensors that are on the sleepers and uh, you can see a pattern emerging here where you've got a bowl across a, a section of about 15 meters of track picked up by I think about four or five nodes at, at, um, at three meter spacings um, and we can see here um, that the, the, the movement the maximum movement is settlement there close to four millimeters in the center of that zone so um, that pretty much wraps up where I was going to get to. Um, I just wanted to just show a couple of examples of that in use. You know, sometimes these sort of track monitoring applications are around major construction projects, in this case, HS2 going into, uh, into Birmingham, or in this case, where the A14 viaduct was being built over the East Coast main line. Um, so these are sort of applications that may go on for a period of maybe one or two years typically. Um, his, this is the East Coast mainline site here with the uh, the track nodes installed. Um, here you can see an optical displacement sensor mounted on a, 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 a tunnel wall looking down at the uh, at the rail tilt sensors on the on the uh, on the track. And um, I, I guess the other the other sort of application is away from these big grand schemes into things which are a little bit um, more every day. So quite often a lot of our projects um, involve maybe just the use of, say, 10 or a dozen sensors over a period of maybe four to eight, eight weeks um, where, some, where there's some activity going on, where there's a bridge refurbishment happening, where there's a culvert relining taking place or where there is concern about an unstable um, embankment or a weak substructure. So uh, they're the sort of applications that, that, that we see on an everyday basis. So that is my whistle stop tour through the world of track monitoring. Um, and uh, I'm going to hand over to Chris now, who's going to uh, talk a little bit about Earthworks. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Um, and, and you've already teed up my section nicely. So yeah, I'm, I'm the I'm the uh, the sandwich filling, I think you put it, um, <laughs> or the the rose between two thorns. You know, I don't know one of the two. Um, yeah, this this bit probably the next 10, 12 minutes, uh, kind of looking at you know uh, geotechnical earthwork uh, and, and predominantly slope based assets uh, near the the operating envelope of the of the railway. So you know. <clears throat> looking at applications that could uh, and, and hopefully kind of monitoring uh, situations that would have an indirect impact on the on the safe operation of a of a railway. Um, so yeah, if you click through the the next slide, um, we're kind of principally talking about two two types of of monitoring or failures. Uh, the first would be a surface slide, you know, landslides, etc. Whether that's um, 
kind of a very dynamic one or, or a slow creep rotational failure. Um, you know, we have many instances of, of both those types of movements uh, happening across across uh, the UK rail network. Uh, and then the other one, uh, slightly more, uh, definitely more dynamic would be a rock fall um, and normally uh, a little bit more kind of disastrous when it comes to uh, sensor um, robustness and durability. I mean, if we've got sensors on the, those rock elements that are failing, uh, they tend to do their job. But, um, you know, we're lucky if they've if they've survived, uh, you know, a few tons of, of hard rock kind of catastrophically failing. But um, yeah, nonetheless, you know, if there's an if there's a a, uh, a concern that that's going to happen, you know, our our kit has been deployed and is deployed on these types of uh, you know at risk environments because you know knowing about it is is more important than uh, preserving preserving a node i dare say so yeah if we um if we move through to the next slide um you know the the drivers for for the kind of the earthwork applications well uh three kind of major challenges one would be uh, the the age of of our geotechnical assets on the railway um you know most of them were built by the by the Victorians using fabulous techniques back then, you know, 130, 150 years ago. But perhaps modern modern methodology would, uh, if they were to be built these days, you know, the approach would be somewhat different. Um, but nonetheless, we have to maintain uh, a significant number of uh, Victorian age uh, built uh, earthworks and assets, and and you know that leads on to to scale um, and location, you know, a lot of them were built and, and very quickly, I think to quote um, Derek Butcher uh, from, from Network Rail, he, he uses the, the term uh, quick, steep and cheap, I think is, is how he describes most of the earthworks uh, across the, the network. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're in either remote locations, um, you know, potentially difficult to access or in many uh, urban environments, you know, the space available is very tight and, and therefore the, steep, the, the slopes are steep because they didn't want to purchase and, and take too much land um, when they were trying to, you know, procure and build the railway. Um, so, you know, both present unique challenges um, and both can present uh, scenarios where failure, you know, can happen um, uh, either little and often or, or, or kind of significant, but, uh, you know, infrequent um, and then you know what's driving perhaps an increase in failures uh, that we're seeing or, or, or an increase in in the risk profile is is the vulnerability of these these earthwork structures uh, themselves and, and you know rain or, or contrasting weather conditions are an earthwork or a, a geotechnical assets um, worst nightmare so going from extremely dry to extremely wet um, which you know has always been uh, a common uh, weather cycle for for the UK, but I think certainly over the last decades and and you know linked clearly with climate change, we've definitely seen much hotter, much hotter and drier summers, and, and then much wetter and wilder winters. So you know the the vulnerability and the and the um, the drivers for potential failures and uh, are only getting more extreme, which uh, is is therefore driving you know more. Uh, appetite to kind of understand and monitor uh, these assets. So yeah, next, next slide, please, Simon. Um, if we're talking about if we talk about kind of the challenge for network rail, the, the challenge that network rail set us, and this was probably back in 2016, 2017, when we really started to develop this solution with them. You know, there has been and there still is plenty of solutions out there that that will look at kind of long term incremental change um, that are reliant on periodic sampling. So you predefine and preset the the measurement frequency and you install it and you, and you let, it do, let it do its job. But, um, you know, the railway needs to also pick up sudden events and get that information back quickly because sudden events are the ones that can be potentially very disastrous, you know, and and the aim is to try and get information to the to route control, to the signaling uh, departments as quickly as possible so that they can verify or, or potentially uh, check what's happened and, and either put a, a speed restriction or, or at the you know kind of severe scenarios shut shut the line to prevent any kind of major um, event so um, we we were asked to kind of think about this and try and, and try and implement this into our solution and, and actually you know what we've kind of branded and, and launched as a set of uh, as a suite of functionalities called infraguard um, 
this this kind of sudden event detection uh, is something that is is capable on on our flat mesh um, kind of network and and the way it works is that between the pre-scheduled sampling um, if any node uh, in that network um, whilst it's in sort of sleep hibernation mode uh, detects it's that it's gone through one degree um, per second of tilt uh, it will wake itself up and it will wake the rest of its network up um, and trigger everything to take a reading uh, and that and, and that's done without kind of the node staying on or draining significant battery life so we've we've managed to maintain the the extended kind of time it can it can last out on site it's still you know north of 10 years um, but what it allows is for that sudden event detection so this you know this is really kind of um, allowed some some risk management and some kind of intelligent monitoring by uh, Network Rail and its and its partners um, on on a number of their slopes. So uh, the next slide, if you just click through, we've got a bit of an animation around the, the three different scenarios. So um, yeah, uh, as I see it starts, there we go. Uh, so three stages. So this would be your typical uh, system, you know, predefined, preset uh, sampling frequency. Uh, maybe a camera as part of that network taking pictures every six hours just for verification, um, and and everything is reporting. Um, you know, in an epoch and then switches off and waits for something to happen. Stage two or, or scenario two would be if, you know, a, a small uh, isolated area within the network and a node under detects it's gone through a movement. In this case, the red one flashing, it would trigger the rest of the network to wake up, increase its uh, reporting frequency and tell the, the gateway to take uh, reading. Stage three, and obviously this is the most spectacular one visually, but also the most alarming one uh, if you are uh, involved in this asset would be, you know, major or sudden failure, you know, tons of material um, kind of slipping off the off the slope uh, and potentially into the to, to the operating envelope of the of the railway. And again, what, what happens here is uh, regardless of whether it was one sensor or a number of sensors involved in that area of, of failure the system would detect that movement wake uh, the entire network up uh, and it's worth pointing out that the camera is deemed as a as a, as a sensor in this so it's part of this sort of flat mesh network <clears throat> so that everything is, is linked and uh, you are getting uh, a very uh, you're getting a data set you've got increased reporting rate but you're also getting quite importantly photo visual verification which is really the you know the kind of the icing on the cake to allow people to verify if something's happened or not. Um, so you know the camera is quite paramount here because there's there's, there, there's things that can cause alarms uh, to these sensors. You know we've we've got plenty of photos of of deer and badgers using them as uh, scratching posts. Um, uh, but the key is, you know, not to shut the line the moment one node uh, triggers an alarm. And the way that we can do that is by, you know, providing clear and, and kind of um, easily interpretable uh, imagery. So if you click through to the next slide, Simon, I think one of the, the, the pieces of hardware that we've really kind of worked hard on developing is this kind of small camera module. And, um, you know, the, the goal or the mission from, from Network Rail and, and the framework partners was that you know we couldn't have any um, illuminators whether that was you know standard lighting or infrared uh, because we don't want any sort of glow uh, for the the uh, train drivers to, to kind of be concerned about um, and you know we've got to keep everything either battery or, or solar powered so no mains is required and, and you know what we did is is kind of develop uh, and play around with, with aperture and shutter speed settings to, to use ambient lighting so that we could um, so that the cameras can work 24 hours a day with with good image quality and I think you'll see you know the, the comparisons here daytime and nighttime are, are pretty favorable um, and that uh, you can determine whether a football sized piece of material has um, fallen or, or moved into the, the the kind of the safe operating window uh, envelope of the of the railway up to about 50 meters. So th those were the criteria that that we kind of developed against, and and you know the, I think the results have allowed have allowed that sort of um, kind of verification to happen uh, now moving forward. So um, if you move forward again, Simon, um, uh, one of the other feature sets that we've got in here, and and this is more probably a bit more prominent when we're looking at uh, slightly slower creeps and maybe not 
the sudden failures that would be very obvious on a um, on a on a on a camera. Um, but the nodes and the intelligence that sits on the nodes and the node network. So um, we've can't you can preset uh, three levels of reporting frequency dependent on the degree of movement that the node's gone through. So, you know, if you imagine you've got a, a, a failing slope and, um, you know, as it's kind of moving uh, through thresholds, uh, what the set the system does is, is in, in increase its uh, sampling frequency um, because obviously the concern is is uh, growing and, and as a user and as an owner you want to be sure that you capture or that you understand when it's getting very close to perhaps uh, red or black level kind of uh, thresholds for uh, actionable response uh, from you know the, the operation so you know, again uh, restrictions or, or shutting the line um, and they can be they're preset before the system goes out there but the, the nodes themselves, when they detect they've gone through that movement, will automatically change uh, that reporting rate. Um, and it's both, you know, from a positive and a negative perspective, if a tilt node was to come back, uh, depending on the, the nature of the rotation. Um, and, you know, all of that sits locally on the nodes and within the network. And there's no sort of requirement to have a live connection with the, with the, the software architecture back at head office. Uh, for those changes to be made. And, and this all leads to, you know, reducing the lag time um, between events uh, and movement and getting the data set into the hands of a, of a decision maker. Uh, next slide, please, Simon. So, yeah, a couple of examples. I'm going to finish with one example and then uh, and then kind of a, a larger rollout um, update. So one of the one of the sections down in the southern uh, network rail region, Wadhurst, Kent, um, there was a uh, a landslip detected. The top graph kind of shows that you know that the sensors de determining and, and demonstrating that the you know there's a there's a slip, there's a significant rotation leading to quite a substantial amount of displacement. I think would go up to north of 200 mil in uh, in in one axis of displacement. But what was um, what was quite interesting here was for the five days preceding this, there was um, small um, incremental uh movements over the you know at, at different you know kind of values uh over the course of the five days that that the client and the the uh, rams the you know the kind of the asset management team were monitoring and and um kind of it indicated that something was going to happen um and actually you know they forecast that the that the landslide uh, and the, the failure would happen and, and obviously made the the kind of um the necessary kind of precautions beforehand um so you know it was the both both functions of the of infragard kind of really driving uh to a positive result there in that the, the slow incremental things were, uh movements were picked up and then the sudden failure was picked up so if we just move to the uh yeah just to kind of put that uh into a photo context you know this is um uh this is the failed section above the and the scar uh, above the tunnel portal um, and you know the the nodes are and the, I mean there was some anchoring in there which you can see which didn't actually kind of keep it fully back uh, and you know our nodes and cameras are kind of highlighted as a schematic over there just to kind of give you an indication of, of kind of what site site setups look like so you know this is one one asset uh, that that um, is monitored using the tilts and, and the cameras uh, in this infraguard setup um, and, you know, what it's led to, if you move to the next slide, Simon, is um, quite a quite a substantial uh, amount of deployments, to be completely honest. Um, you know, we've so far we've we've had kind of several or, or even significant rollout um, rollouts of these infraguard systems uh, across the, the southern uh, LNW. Anglia and Wales and Western regions. Um, we've spoken to the other regions, and there's certainly appetite and and kind of uh, a, a willingness to to progress um, with those. And actually, kind of in terms of volume, I think we're just tipping over the twenty thousand tilt sensor quantity now as a cumulative amount. Um, uh, and each, in fact, all of the deployments have gone out with at least one or two cameras along the, the hundred meter sections. Uh, and yeah, if you to put them all in a in a in a line as a cumulative uh, distance, uh, it currently equates to kind of 40 kilometres of of network rail earthworks with um, this 
intelligent InfraGuard um, monitoring suite on it. So, um, yeah, we, we're quite proud of the, the the relationship and the kind of the collaboration we've had with Network Rail and it's you know all of its framework partners, in particularly in these regions where where you know the the deployments have been significant uh, in you know designing, testing, and then rolling out this for for better risk management of of their you know critical assets really. Uh, and I'll probably just leave it. I think I'll leave it there. I think the next slide is is handing over to Callum. It is. There we go. So over to Callum. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, so yeah, wireless systems such as ours can be used to monitor structures as well. Uh, this can include OLEs, retaining walls, bridges, tunnels. Um, these can be standalone monitoring programs, or these can be incorporated into earthworks or track monitoring. Uh, solutions. Um, a lot of the structures uh, such as OLE mass and retaining walls uh, can use similar tilt technology. Um, it could be tilt affixed uh, to OLE mass with magnets uh, or clamps or it could be tilt sensors affixed to buildings or retaining walls to look at rotational movement or sediment or heave if they're connected um, as chains. However, some of the structures uh, require more than just rotational movement. So that's why, you know, Simon's touch base on on the laser distos that we have uh, that have the tilt sensor technology, but then also have that have that distance measurement as well. And then we also have third party sensors that Simon's touch base on um, that can incorporate third party sensors such as crack sensors or piezometers, strain gauges um, and everything in between. So uh, just want to touch on a couple of these case studies. Uh, that we've used our equipment on and yeah hopefully you find some of them interesting okay so yep next slide for there simon okay so on hs2 we've gone we've done a lot of work on hs2 both long-term and short-term monitoring projects this could either be again the ole's retaining walls utilities um we've done a lot of earth retention structures where we're using the vibrating wire strain gauges um, or load cells and we're bringing them to a wireless back to the back to the cloud uh, and incorporating that tilt technology as well from say the sheet pile walls so yep lots of uh, lots of different technology going back to the cloud next slide um, and here here's a photograph of the crack sensor itself so relatively straightforward there uh, that could be incorporated you know so it's, it's an older victorian abutment or wing wall um, so you could be monitoring that and you don't have to go you know don't have to go to site every day that's probably recording every 20 minutes for the next 12 to 15 years next slide okay so linton bridge this rather interesting project so after a storm about 2015 uh, the engineers noticed that there were some cracks appearing on the bridge and you can actually see some sediment of the bridge deck itself in the uh, in the image on the bottom left there. Um, so we were brought in to utilize tilt sensors and you put the tilt sensor on a tilt beam, you interconnect those tilt beams and you can basically create a daisy chain to look at sediment or, or heave. Um, we affixed them to both sides of the parapets and over time we monitored sediment while the repair works were taking place which was grouting um, of the scour underneath that central pier during the entire project we saw four mil of movement which took about four months for the repair work and then another 10 months afterwards to look if there was any uh, any movement happening after after the event or after the repairs sorry so yep that's linton uh, Another way we can do bridge monitoring um, is with tilt sensors and optical displacement sensors. So for this bridge, um, what they were doing is they were removing, well, they're actually loading the bridge. They were actually changing the deck. They were increasing some, they're adding some barriers uh, and increasing the walkways on the outer sides of the bridge. So they wanted to know what the vertical and lateral deformation vertical and lateral deformation was on the bridge during this loading. So we had ODSs inside the jack arches shooting horizontally from one side to another across all the members uh, and then we also had ODSs at the bottom of the girders pointing down to targets uh, alongside the railway. 
so that's still that's still uh, currently monitoring there. Uh, we've seen some pretty good data, but unfortunately, I was unable to uh, to share that with you here today. Next slide. Okay, um, Chipping Sodbury Tunnel. So this is a four-kilometer tunnel on the uh, uh, in the west. Um, and then during uh, the electrification of that track, uh, they had to lower the track by 150 mil to fit the uh, OLEs in. So during that, they needed to monitor the tunnel lining itself to ensure that nothing was happening because the the, the, the track to the left was running at the time. So they'd do one track, uh, drop one track whilst the other track was open and then they'd swap it over. So they had to ensure that nothing was happening to the track or to the tunnel lining during the lowering or the removal of ballast. Um, how we did this is using tilt sensors at set intervals along the track. You can see that on the image. And then we also had tilt sensors um, affixed to beams at certain areas. You can see that to the left and to the right of this image um, on the sides of the tunnel. And we also had ODSs uh, on the crown um, and on the sides of the tunnel pointing um, to left and right to monitor convergence. Uh, there you go. You can see the image there. Um, so yeah, and we also had ODSs shooting down to the sleepers to measure if there was any sediment or slew of the track. Uh, as Simon touched base on, that's another way that we can monitor slew. Uh, that's it from me, I think. Next slide. <coughs> yes. OK, thanks, Cal. I think we've probably gone a little bit over our um, uh, appointed time, but um, uh, hopefully there's still a bit of time for questions. So I just really wanted to wrap up. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, we've given a bit of an overview of the technology. Hopefully um, we've given you some sort of ideas about um, uh, how we might be able to answer some of the questions that you might have. Um, the uh, the map that Chris showed with lots of dots in the south of England is one certainly that we're keen to uh, to modify and get a few of those dots migrating a bit further north. So uh, it's interesting to talk to, uh, to people in Glasgow and Edinburgh from that point of view. Um, but I think, you know, if we have done anything tonight, I would hope that we've described a method that is easy to install, that doesn't require um, you know, NASA level expertise and specialist skills that um, provides loads of data that allows you to have sufficiently frequent sampling and repeatable data to really put stuff at your fingertips to allow you to do predict and prevent maintenance um, and, and, and really, you know, step towards an intelligent piece of infrastructure um, that you can manage in a, in a, in a sort of modern way. Um, hopefully um, there are some sort of sustainable themes here. I, I, we like to think that um, that reducing the need for travel by sending surveyors and inspectors out routinely over a prolonged period of time is going to reduce your carbon footprint. It's also going to reduce your safety exposure. You know, it's taking boots off ballast. It allows your smart people to be looking at data, making decisions rather than um, trudging along the ballast uh, to get to a site. Um, we hopefully have described something that's going to do this not just today and tomorrow, but for years into the future. You know, this, this sort of quick to install, but long life um, approach is pretty fundamental, I think, to, to what we've tried to engineer. Um, and if all of that stuff kind of stacks up together, then hopefully it's going to be a solution which in the um, in the medium to long term is, is really quite highly cost effective, um, is going to help you uh, get a little bit more bang for your buck in these uh, these challenging times. So um, that is about everything we were going to cover. Um, and I think if we go open mic all round, we're happy to. Um, Thank you, Simon. Well, there's uh... There's been a lot of interest in the chat. There's a few questions there sitting ready. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll just run through uh, if you've not seen them already uh, one by one. Uh, so the first set of questions from Tom Wilson. Are the nano sensors which measure gauge and can all fit it to the same side of the track? And if yes, on the same side of the rail. How far apart are the sensors placed? Can they measure track twist over a three meter wheelbase? Yeah, I can take that one if you want. Uh, the, the 
the latter, I think uh, Simon actually answered just after you posted the question, Tom. So maybe that was a perfect timing. But yeah, um, we most I'd say most of our, if not all of our uh, installations on track bed is at three meter spacing. Uh, or the sensors are at three meter sp spacing uh, for that um, particular reason. So that's the network rail specification, and it's there to look at track twist over the the, the wheel bases that are typically on the rolling stock. So um, yeah, all of those deployments that are you would have seen in those pictures are at three meter spacing. Uh, and then um, with regards to installation, we they don't they don't have to be uh, all on the same side of the uh, of the track of the rail. But it is a lot easier from an installation point of view uh, and alignment point of view, because um, if you get all the axes installed in the same orientation um, and on the same side, you don't have to remind and, and rely on site notes to kind of uh, run your calculations. Because, you know, if you've got it on opposing side, opposing sleepers, sides of the sleeper, I should say, every three meters, you're having to reverse the calculation to get the movement um, in the in the same direction so uh we tend to recommend it all going down one side of the the track it also from a visual perspective it, it tends to be more noticeable if they're all in a in a line and it avoids people more often than not with the temptation to kind of try and kick them <laughs> um, yeah. so yeah we, I, we, we still we, we still need somewhere to walk uh, yeah exactly <laughs> so so we uh yeah we kind of keep them we try and keep them neat and tidy all in the same uh kind of alignment down one one side of the the track and obviously it's um the calculation is, is across the sleeper so um to you'd need you couldn't infer uh movement on a second uh track if um, if you didn't have you know data points on on the sleepers associated with that track, so if if two two tracks or more needed monitoring, typically you know a, a user would deploy um, sensors on on sleepers for each of those tracks. If I hope well, I think that's answered your questions. Is the can based on the sleeper rake then, or uh, the, the inclination of the sleeper? Yes, so so we we are so the the cant is based on the sleeper being a fixed uh, a fixed uh, and rigid beam, um, and we are looking at the the rotation of the sleeper um, and the calculation or the the assumption is that that movement of the sleeper is uh, inferred in in the rail, um, and that's I mean that's. How I get a permanent optical monitoring is is also inferred using um, you know permanently installed prisms. So we've kind of got a like for like a complementary solution. So that's that's the the um, kind of assumption that is that is uh, made by Network Rail and and, and you know users. Well, Chris, there's a there's a very interesting uh, presentation in the PW uh, YouTube channel about sleepers, and the presenters are are Jim and Tom. So, okay, uh, <laughs> it, it was the one of the most fascinating uh, presentations that we've ever had, and and I, I strongly see that. <laughs> yeah, and, and if it, you can you know, catch I, it, it's 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 not my area of expertise, but I was uh, enthralled by it. So there, I, there's going yeah, to be some things to do. I will because well, it's definitely. Uh, there's definitely conversations, many a conversation about, um, you know, a, attaching directly to the rail web and, and we've got mag mounts, we've got, you know, uh, adhesives that that allow it. And we've actually got a um, kind of a high vibration filter inside the nodes to um, to kind of reduce erroneous readings caused by, um, you know, the dynamic uh, if, if it was sampling as, as the train was kind of going over. Um, so we have got scenarios where it's installed on the sleeper, uh, oh, sorry, on the rail, um, on the rail web. But typically most deployments and, and most kind of clients want them on the sleeper and are happy with yeah. the, the data that kind of comes from there to infer what's going on. That probably uh, segues nicely into David Lindsay's question, which is, is there a way that dynamic twist can be recorded? A recording interval of 30 minutes wouldn't pick up twist under traffic potentially. Correct. Yeah, we I think I think we are um, we're not a dynamic monitoring uh, or, or a manufacturer provider of dynamic monitoring solutions. We we are of static kind of more incremental time series based sampling. Um, so our nodes are not designed to kind of 
be in the hertz, subhertz frequency to look at voiding. Um, at the moment, I'd say it's certainly without giving uh, yeah, too many trade secrets away. Um, voiding and uh, the dynamic sampling that would be required for those types of concerns is certainly on our uh, development roadmap uh, and um, aspirations. Uh, but at the moment, our solutions are not are not designed to kind of look at that that sort of uh, dynamic concern. Okay, Link, linking that, uh, Jim's got a connected question there. Uh, is the recording continuous with all set intervals? I think the implication was that you can alter the intervals, although there is intervals. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Would, for, so, uh, would, for example, a significant thermally induced movement trigger an Im immediate report? Is that a possibility? Uh, if if it if that thermal event created or or uh, you know caused uh, in well if we're talking about tilt a rotation to that uh, to that degree so one degree uh, per second um, then yes it would uh, if if the, if the infraguard kind of feature set was on was you know on that network um, but but also Chris the, I guess the other point there is that because there's a couple of questions here about trigger level tr trigger thresholds and methods of alarming which kind of related you know it is possible to set the without without relying on the responsive um mode of the sensor that chris described with infraguard um it is up to you what threshold you set for yeah. an alert um it is also up to you what sampling frequency you set um we typically talk about 30 minutes because it is a you know, for most applications, it's practical and it lasts a long time. Um, in a shorter um, deployment around a construction site, for example, there's nothing stopping you having it deploying sub minute, sub minute, sub minute. Um, you can get so you have virtually real time um, data flow. There yeah. will be a lag, of course, there'll be a lag for it to come through the comms system, maybe a couple of minutes, but um, both the thresholds and the sampling frequency are user defined. So if yeah. you want more frequent data, you can set it to provide data at a much higher frequency. And if you want to be alerted via text or SMS um, of a movement which is um, very small, um, yeah, it's up to you where you set those thresholds, where you want. If you want to be woken up in the middle of the night every, every time there's a, a millimeter movement, um, then um, that's up to you. Yeah, I've, uh, I've been on a few projects where the thresholds have been set particularly mm. tight and what happens is you relax and relax and relax until you don't get the phone calls during the night because otherwise you, you're up three or four times during the night. To, Absolutely, to you, you become but, numb, you become numb to the system which kind of then you start then because many things can cause a, a, an alarm. You know, again, you know, people like to uh, the inquisitive nature of humans like to pod and poke, uh, prod and poke things when they're on site. So, you know, and these are very sensitive uh, kind of sensors inside these units. So, you know, they, they can be triggered by uh, human intervention, uh, which, you know, the the system is geared to, as so I mentioned, email or, or, or SMS alerts. Um, and then you've got to kind of verify what's happened. I think just to complete that uh kind of sampling and, and threshold uh, topic, you can also adjust your sampling remotely. So once it's gone out onto site, it isn't, uh, it can't, it's not a case of it can't be changed from there. A lot of the, the, the from the back end and from web monitor, you can adapt and, and upload and, and change the monitoring sampling uh, as you see fit throughout the, the, the life of the, the sensor and the project. So, and the same with the alar uh, uh, alarms and alerting as well, the thresholds. So all of it can be done as and when you, you'd want to change it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jim's question, uh, someone else will have to, or maybe Jim can, CIV177 monitoring site, uh, is this a, a, a viable use? or say a UTX where a track access midweek is non-existent. Maybe yeah. Jim will open his mic and ask that. And I'm not quite I, sure what a CIV 177 is, to be honest. So, uh, you know, I mean, the under track crossing. Callum, you, 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 that's your yeah, we've done. Me. Yeah, we've done um, a lot of UTXs um, very recently. And yeah, for the last couple of years, we've been doing a lot of, I need to have a look at CIV 177, but as far as I'm aware, you know, people have come to us and said, 
we've got UTXs. Here's, you know, we need your tilt sensors. Um, yeah, so we've provided that. So we've done a lot of that works uh, based primarily on the fact that there's the possessions are hard to get. So you install them for a week, you monitor them for the week or two weeks and then remove them. As Simon said, you know, a lot of these projects can also be short term. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that answers your question, but I will get back to you on Civ 177. <laughs> Uh, that, that, does, that does answer my question. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks for that. Uh, bearing in mind the long linear nature of the railway, how are the sites selected? I think that's very much customer driven. Uh, yeah. so, so there's a risk based approach adopted. Uh, the sites that are monitored are generally the ones with some historic pro problems. I think that is that is true, Tom. <laughs> uh, yeah. We're not monitoring earthworks where, there, where there's been well, I've spent 24 years reacting to earthworks problems, going to sort things where they've already failed, and then we don't do anything about the areas where it's about to fail. <laughs> I was asking because, I mean, would the site at Carmen have been monitored? No. If you is know what I mean. So is, is, it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is a risk-based approach now going to be adopted where, say, for example, Network Rail will identify at-risk sites and yeah. then stump up for the monitoring to be placed there as the insurance policy against another Carmen situation. Uh, we certainly believe that that's the approach they're now taking in uh, in the regions that we've kind of that we are dealing with them uh, on these rollouts. So, uh, of course, the, the kind of the first the first deployments were on, I think, sites where they've had, you know, they have or have had common problems. Uh, but certainly, you know, if we talk about the southern region in particular, where uh, they've kind of were the kind of the pioneers, I'd say, across all of the network regions with regards to deploying this. And that a lot of it's triggered by, you know, the nature of their um, geotechnical earthworks. It's a lot of it is chalk with, um, you know, kind of laminated clay sat on top. So a very slippery chalk with uh, kind of clay that tends to, to fail and slip off it. Um, they put systems in on their uh, really high risk sites first and then certainly over the last 12 to 18 months um, they have taken a risk-based approach and have put them on sites that are that if it were to fail would cause significant impact to the to the network but have perhaps not had any kind of legacy problems uh, to kind of drive that but just looking at you know where the impact would be most significant and therefore kind of prioritize the the deployments the, the sites that need the systems um uh, first and foremost so it, it looks like they are taking that approach um which is you know really good to see i think that the, the it's significant that the uh, orr our report into carmont you know lord, lord mayor's report had recommended various um steps but certainly one of them was the um the greater use of um of techniques, not just this, but remote sensing techniques, and he does specifically mention wireless remote monitoring as one of those sort of things to, to, to bear in mind. And and I think that report does very much take a risk based, based approach. It does say that, you know, that, that Earthworks managers should should look at these things on a risk based approach. And, and that was in a follow up from Carmont. Okay. Uh, flow sensors for outfall rate from track drainage. Uh, it has been, funny enough, it's been uh, tabled by uh, the Geotech team uh, from Scotland, uh, the Network Rail, uh, Scottish Rail team. So uh, it isn't something we've, we haven't got a sensor or a flow rate kind of measurement device at the moment, but it's something that we've kind of had some functional conversations around with, with, uh, with the engineers, uh, and we're now kind of looking at what we can do to, to to add that to a capability, yeah, to look at more shallow washouts uh, than the kind of the big block failures, um, commonly caused by drainage or, or severe weather. Okay, uh, I think you've adequately covered my question about storage, perhaps just in terms of time that we've got available. Uh, Tom had a question about, do you replace batteries or do you just replace a sensor? What's easiest in the time frame? You mentioned many years of service out of these. so Yeah, uh, we, 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 we've got battery replacement uh, capability. We offer it as kind of, you know, a service and a, and a battery replacement um, kind of uh, capability. We tend to advise that it's done uh, off site in a more kind of uh, cleaner environment. Yeah, cleaner environment because the 
you know, there's a, there's a knack to kind of resealing the enclosures to make sure that the IP rating is um, is intact. Uh, so, uh, and luckily, because they're out on site for so long, you know, if if it's done, you know, it's anywhere between kind of five and twelve years, uh, the impact isn't isn't too great. And and actually, a lot of people do tend to perhaps upgrade by then because we've gone through various iterations and there's new products. So, um, yeah, we. That's kind of the, the common kind of approach to it, I'd say, from our customers. OK, and then uh, Tom's question regarding uh, monitoring during or the inadvertent monitoring when suddenly there's a tamping or maintenance exercise, that really in terms of your what you provide is a dashboard to provide to the customer and it, it, they would be switching that off if the track's been messed about with them. Yeah, we 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 actually, I mean, a lot of our nodes have, have been been in, you know, uh, scenarios where the tamping has, has happened, and and you know they are robust enough to to kind of uh, survive that. Obviously, there's a there's a significant amount of kind of rebaselining that needs to be done, or we switch all the alarms off beforehand because uh, you know it typically invokes um, significant kind of rotations and movements. Um, the other thing is that our our track bed plates that we install on the sleepers. They're a two part um, accessory, so we can we can actually or a person on site can pop the top bit off if they really were concerned about the tamping and then can re reattach it. Then there is obviously another element of rebaselining because you, you'd see some movement there, but it does certainly protect the node from the from the tamping activities. I'm conscious of time here. Just uh, there is a there's a question there that Jim's posted, but if I just open the mics. Because uh, we'll get into a debate between <laughs> about whether we should me be measuring inflow or outflow rates at culverts. Uh, I mean, we'd we'd generally be interested in in getting the input uh, on kind of in flow rate monitoring uh, and and how you know a company like us could approach it, and if they're as you know as is correctly being discussed, inflow or outflow, and the reasons to why. So. If there is some thought around it, um, well, we would an, certainly like to follow up on that. Definitely, an amazing private consultant called uh, Watson Engineering uh, yeah. <laughs> who can provide <laughs> that as service. Hey, Jim. Oh, most most certainly, Angus. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but I, my, my question kind of really really springs from our our brief discussion of of Carmont because when you actually look back. To the reason the drainage was put in at Carmont, it was actually related to the very, very deep rock cutting to the east or to the south of Carmont. Uh, so drainage was put in there, but the problem then arose at the outfall, which didn't previously exist. So yeah. interesting one to, mm. to mull over and discuss. Like everything we do, a link to the ORR's presentation. It's we're a system. You know, the railway's a system of systems. W solving one problem led to another. So the, the the over well over my lifetime, I've been to Carmont a number of times to fix rock cuttings and and yeah. failures there. Uh, finally, we've come up with a solution. We're going to sort the drainage, and what that drainage exercise did was then uh, lead to a further uh, catastrophe, of course. Uh, Right, uh, mic's open. Uh, not too many questions, please, because I kind of want to close the meeting. But uh, any other questions for Simon, Chris, or Callum from the audience, please? I had a question on cost, but if you don't want to discuss due to sensitivity, but let's say you wanted to instrument a kilometre of track for. Um, can twist longitudinal wave faults. What would a kilometre worth of sensors and the system cost? Uh, do we want to answer that publicly? Uh, <laughs> um, That's OK, um, I can understand but, it. Yeah. it, it Tom's, got it a, Tom's got a job <laughs> in mind, so. Uh, yeah, no, we're. Um, yeah, I think we're, we're kind of at the the we're about the six hundred pound a node uh, mark. If that uh, and and if you were to do every three meters, uh, okay, 
That, get, that uh, gives me a good, I can factor that one up. Yeah. But the kind of thing that I see the benefit of your system is the first time it does the, the railway children thing and flags up a potential issue. People weigh then get it fixed before before the catastrophe, like the uh, the slip above the tunnel that you demonstrated. Yeah. And and yeah. The, the value of that is very difficult. To, you know, when you put essentially you're selling the insurance policy, you put the modulus there, you set the system up, and the idea is that before the catastrophe, you've got the chance to go in and fix things or stop trains or prevent the catastrophe. And that should be when that happens, that should be then equated into a dollar value so that people can see the value of having the remote monitoring mm -hmm. process. That's that's a big sell for you, surely. It is, Tom. Uh, and if you'd like a job, let us know because you've just sold it fabulously. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it, it, and I think we're lucky with the, certainly in the UK, um, uh, People, I think most uh, most of the railway audience understand, you know, that kind of long term cost benefit um, that and the the kind of the indication or the early warning that you may get from these systems, which would, uh, you know, you can react to and therefore prevent major uh, costly and um, you know potentially potentially safety uh, in events from from happening um, by early intervention. So it does get weighed up. Uh, against against that from a from a you know a kind of a cost benefit perspective, um, so it is one of the reasons why I think you know the the UK rail industry does adopt this technology uh, you know fairly uh, fairly well and, and in kind of reasonably large quantities. Um, so yeah, you're spot on with that kind of value versus output observation. Okay, well I'll just. Uh... I'll, I'm wearing many hats. I think I've got three hats on tonight, so I'm going to draw the meeting to a close with a vote of thanks. So thank you to you from Sensive for providing a full sandwich of wireless <laughs> condition and monitoring. I'll emphasise with my own experience in this field that this is a, a very quick sheep dip into the systems available and the devil is in the detail. Uh, Simon covered Cant, Twist, Slough and Longitudinal Settlement. Uh, Chris went on to talk about my own area of expertise in earthworks and slope monitoring. Uh, great to hear Chris uh, Derek Butcher's quote, quick, steep and cheap. Uh, and I must emphasise the use of these tilt sensors is so much better than going out with a theodolite or distometer and measuring targets on timber pegs in similar circumstances, uh, which I have been involved in over the last 24 years. Uh, so much cheaper and cost effective. Uh, great to see that there's 40 kilometres of InfraGuard in use on the UK infrastructure, and I would suggest that that must be the highest, most critical sites. And uh, if we're going to manage our infrastructure in this way, there's probably many more kilometres to add. Uh, Callum went on uh, to describe structures, OLE tunnels and bridges, and it's great to see through all of the presentations case studies. We love to see the case studies of jobs done. And I'm very pleased to see two of the projects I was involved in at Wadhurst and Linton Bridge, which wasn't a conspiracy. We didn't pre-plan that. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good to see. So if you can all join me in thanking uh, Sensi for tonight's presentation, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If there's no other business, uh, you're welcome to go about your evening. Thank you for joining us. And good